All right. Good morning, everybody. It's morning in Seattle, which is where I'm at. So um, welcome back to our second day, Bioconductor 2021, to our uh, short uh, talks. Today we're talking, this track is apps and frameworks. Uh, everyone give me a, a thumbs up if you can hear me and see me. Perfect. So we've got uh, quite a quite a great lineup today. I'm really excited to hear um, to hear some of these talks. Um, a couple of housekeeping um, items that you guys have all heard before. So um, if you have uh, if you have questions, we're going to save all of our questions to the end after all four uh, talks have gone through. Uh, you can post your questions in the Q and A panel on um, on the right. Uh, we prefer the Q&A to the chats. Um, so since all the questions are being held to the end, if you'll please uh, tag your question with the speaker or the topic so that we'll know how to direct it appropriately. Several of these talks are, are going to be videos, so there won't be an opportunity to, to pause and answer questions during it. So hold your questions to the end, and then we'll stage them and, and address them at the end. Um, as always, you can upvote questions. Uh, if you'd like to come on stage and present your question uh, in person, just raise your hand and uh, the moderator will bring you on board. Uh, please be liberal with your emoticons to give to give feedback and thumbs up and, and, um, and uh, trophies and sunglasses. Those are all really fun. Um, and of course, the videos will be available very shortly afterwards. Uh, so uh, with that, I will introduce our first uh, first talk. Just pull up my notes over here. Our first talk um, is going to be from Emanuele Ivono. Um, it is entitled Uncover App, an interactive graphical application for clinical assessment of sequence coverage at the base pair level. And we'll Maria turn Lino. the time over. I am a PhD student in data science and computation at University of Bologna and I'm currently working in medical genetic unit at Sant'Ursula Malpighi Hospital. First of all, thank you all organizers for the opportunity to speak and present our package, Uncover App Lib, containing Uncover App, an interactive graphical application for clinical assessment of coverage at base per level. I will uh, just give a little bit overview of the background, so the rapid spread of next generation sequence technology led to development of bioinformatic tool for data analysis and interpretation. However, despite increased accuracy of a viable approach, the need to assess sequence equality at base per level still pose challenges for diagnostic accuracy. One of the most uh, uh, popular quality parameters is the percentage of target base characterized by low depth of coverage. Sequence coverage may drop below due to technical issues in hybridization capture, for example, or in alignment as well as in clinical relevant genes. And these regions potentially high relevant variant, but non annotation about the relevance of uncovered regions is usually returned with them. To meet this end, we develop and cover up to visualize low depth of coverage data with a potential functional and clinical consequence to prioritize the inspection of low depth of coverage regions before resequencing all coverage gap or making assertion about completeness of diagnostic test. Uncover App is a bioconductor air package implemented as a shiny app and provide an interactive graphical of depth of coverage analysis, giving SFP annotation of low depth of coverage position and a simple statistical framework to estimate whether depth of coverage is enough to detect variant with a given uh, alpha fraction. Uncover app display four page, each provide different module analysis, analysis module. So all functionality of Uncover app are based on bad file containing depth of coverage or genomic position of a target genes. The bad file is obtaining provide a list of gene of interest and a list of sample, in particular a list of one path. So interested gene can be plotted and annotated 
one by one in different samples and a spreadsheet report can be downloaded in order to facilitate the analysis put of the application and to type all allele frequencing could be used to prioritize low depth of coverage position allele frequency from GNOMAD and allele frequency for a calculator and lastly the package provides a statistical framework to estimate whether coverage is enough to detect variant with a given allele fraction and this framework could, could be um, especially useful for somatic variants. A cover up is available as a bioconductor packet. When uh, user load and cover up lib for the first time, the first thing to do is uh, download a notation file. So get a notation file function, allow to download the annotation file from Zenodo, and the function does return an uh, our object but store the annotation file in a cache and so user can see can show can see uh, the, the cache path the local cache is managed by bio file cache or bioconductor package and this function is just required during the first installation launching run and cover up command a shiny app appears in our default browser and this is the home page of uncover app Graphical inspection and annotation required as input file a bad file so user can make it on preprocessing page so user can load a list of gene of interest here and a list of OBAM file in this ad box and reference genome chromosome notation quality mapping quality and base quality is required by the user. This is a bad file resulting from preprocessing step. This is a bad file with crops of start and position, coverage value, and nucleotide counts. When preprocessing is done, user can move on the coverage analysis page and import input file just made and assess sequence coverage with a user defined threshold. So here, user can change the default threshold. The user can explore all gene coverage and zoom in a specific axon or in a short genomic interval and obtain a table below the plot, the number of base or axon or in total gene above coverage threshold. Functional and clinical annotation of all potential non-synonymous single nucleotide variants across the examined low depth coverage site is available when uh, both in web page both as a spreadsheet format. So the cell are colored according to a specified threshold for a little frequency for CAD, for MAP, SIFT, or clean bar and OMIM. So the cell will appear red when the predictor are other threshold, otherwise the cell appear green. And cover up host a calculation of maximum allele frequency so user can set allele frequency cutoff based on a specified assumption about genetic architecture of disease and obtain the annotation both in app, both as a, a spreadsheet format. Binomial distribution page returned 95% of probability distribution of the variant supporting read on the input genomic position, so users should define the expected allele fraction, so probability of success, so the expected fraction of variant read and variant read, so uh, the number of success, so the minimum number of variant read required by the user to support variant calling. The comment color change according to binomial proportion interval if the estimate interval with a 95% of confidence is included or higher than a user defined variant read, the color that appears blue, otherwise, is red. The NGS technology no uniform coverage is the most relevant shortcoming. Therefore, a meticulous quality control is required to delete low depth of coverage. Although, uh, in this way, there is a loss 
or potentially user information in clinical setting. So we uh, have developed a user-friendly package to easy visualize and annotate sequence coverage. And in clinical setting, Uncover App aims to easy retrieve information about the relevance of missed data through graphical expansion, functional annotation, and probabilistic method. I'm glad to answer your question. And here you can find my contact. So thank you so much. Thank you, Manuela. That was a great presentation. Really look forward to, um, to exploring that. Next up, we have um, another short talk. Um, we have Ivo Ki, who is uh, going to be here in place of Muradzan Akhmedov. Uh, he is going to be presenting Omics Playground, a user-friendly and interactive self-service bioinformatics platform for the in-depth analysis, visualization, and interpretation of transcriptomics and proteomics data. CDO of Big Omics, I'd like to present uh, our Omics Playground. Uh, it's called Playground because we want to uh, inf yeah, encourage people to play with their data because we think that's the, uh, the way to discover new things um, from your data. So why do we need an app? You would uh, maybe say we have a lot of we have already a lot of R packages, but just you have to admit that programming is not for everyone. Um, also, um, R there's a, the problem of the package jungle. There are about eighteen thousand R packages, more than two thousand bioconductor packages, and it's, uh, it's really hard actually to to find or choose the right one. Uh, actually, nowadays, uh, programming is more, the glue is the program, I would say, and gluing is hard. Um, say, for example, uh, if I give you all the parts of a car, can you make me a car? No, that's pretty hard, right? So, making apps that work with still with packages that are already there, it's, it's hard. Uh, making production-grade apps is hard. Uh, may, the academia is not rewarded to make actually these kind of integrated apps. Uh, academia tools are often ephemeral. Um, when the postdoc goes away, no one maintains the apps. Um, yeah, app design uh, takes, I think, 80% of the time, and just 20% is programming. There's, of course, another 100% of debugging. Um, yeah. The features of after, of Omics Playground are the following. We we use R Shiny. It's based on R Shiny. Uh, so the back end and the front is tightly integrated. Uh, development is really fast. We 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 like it. Uh, we use about uh, more than 140 R bioconductor packages. It has um, 15 plus analysis modules and it makes over 100 of plots from your data. We implement multiple statistics called methods, and the program is fully dockerized and cloud ready. We have, of course, the standard features like um, the data visualization per gene, clustering, intersection analysis, differential expression analysis, enrichment analysis, and functional analysis uh, from the pathways. But we have also some really nifty um, modules like cell type identification for single cell RNA sec. Uh, we have dr implemented a drug connectivity mapping with L1000 um, drug profiles. We have a special biomarker module which uses the latest machine learning methods. We've implemented WGCNA and we have also a very nice model, we call it experiment similarity. It finds the most similar experiments to your experiments um, according to the full chains profiles. Um, nowadays, uh, the analysis is um, is getting more complex. You don't have just one contrast, one data set. So, uh, to see the multiple contrasts, um, we, we, we can compare visually the volcano plots all together in our platform. We have also activation maps where you can see um, the, the enrichment of a pathway across all your contrast. We implemented multiple algorithms and uh, we can see the volcano plots of each individual um, algorithm so you can see which 
method is more powerful. And we, we implemented this kind of meta statistics with p-value aggregation to actually uh, find more robust um, um, biomarkers or um, differential expression genes using these multiple methods. And the other thing is also um, to go across one data set. How can you compare multiple uh, data sets? Yes, we have a kind of a module where you can compare two data sets. For example, one is um, transcriptomics and the other is proteomics, and you can compare them visually. Um, as I said before, we have this experiment similarity module where you can really um, compare across data sets. Uh, some words about the UI and UX design. Uh, we really intend this program to be for the biologist. Um, so we take much effort to, uh, to um, provide rich visualization. We choose simplicity over features. We, we put in sensible defaults everywhere we can and the figures are publication ready, uh, exportable in PDF and we have extensive documentation and information for all our, our modules and uh, algorithms. Um, yeah, w there are plots, but uh, we prefer dashboards where you see uh, multiple plots, like, like a car. It's not just one line, but you see the whole dashboard. So, so also in our design, we, we don't want to give you just plots, no, just a, a dashboard that gives much and more an overview and, and the um, and, and the relationship between the, the plots. Uh, also very important is um, in our UX design, we, we really want to have a simplicity, uh, much more than f more features, feature overload. So the, the example is the Space Shuttle cockpit that you see on the left and the SpaceX Dragon cockpit on the right, which is much cleaner, much simpler. Um, so uh, for us, I think it's important for the biologists not to be overloaded with features. Now I will show you the demo of the, um, the platform. some words about bioinformatics 3.0 where we say open analytics versus open source. We think that tertiary analytics is nowadays the bottleneck. Um, if analysis can be divided into primary, secondary and tertiary, in the beginning it was um, uh, primary analysis that was the bottleneck, data acquisition, data management, because primary it was uh, expensive. Uh, secondary analysis where we see the pipeline and the data cleaning. Uh, I think yeah that was uh, a bottleneck let's say 10 years ago but nowadays I think the, um, the tertiary analytics where visualization, interpretation and reporting takes place is most of the, um, the, the time. Uh, so um, let, yeah as I said in 2000 um, we can call it bioinformatics 1.0. You had the early adopters and they were programming in Perl and, and Excel actually also. And they, they were like the programmers. And in 2010, around 2010, I think there was bioinformatics 2.0 where um, open source uh, uh, became stronger. R, RStudio, Python and Jupyter notebooks. And the, the center people were the bioinformaticians. But uh, I think now we are at stage that we are bioinformatics 3.0 2020. Um, here, a democratization of analytics needs to take place. And 
we, we come to an era where not open source is not enough, but we need some kind of open analytics. Uh, here, the centerpiece becomes the uh, center person becomes the biologist that interprets this data, and we think the um, bioinformatics tools, the self-search bioinformatics tools, can solve this problem. Um, the cloud-based bioinformatics tools. Uh, so, for more info, please read our paper uh, from last year. Uh, it was published in uh, in NAR Genomics and Bioinformatics. Um, Omics Playground is uh, freely available in GitHub and Docker Hub. Uh, it's open source for academia, and you can try our platform at public.bigomics.ch. Uh, last but not least, thank you all the our shiny developers and especially our studio. They do awesome stuff. Uh, thank you the whole team at Bigomics, and thank you BioC 2021 organizers and you for listening. We are hiring, so if you are a uh, shiny lover, shiny expert, and believe in our vision, please contact us. Thank you. Well, that was a lot of enthusiastic response there. Thank you very much, um, Evo, for that presentation. I'll just take a moment here to remind people that um, we'll take questions. Um, uh, at the end, but that shouldn't stop you when one occurs to you to go ahead and throw it into the to the to the uh, the window there, and so that you don't forget. Just make sure you tag it for who it's going to. Also, look through there and upvote questions that uh, that you think are are particularly good questions or that you really want to hear, hear an answer to, uh, so that we can know um, and prioritize some of these questions. All right, um, our next our next talk. Uh, comes from Jovan Tanevesky. Um, he's from the um, University of Heidelberg. Um, he's going to be sharing with us uh, MISTI, Multi-View Intercellular Spatial Modeling Framework. Jovan. Thanks, John. Uh, I hope that you all can hear me and can see my presentation. Yes, wonderful. I can see your reactions. Good. So. Um, Today I'm going to talk about uh, a framework that we call MISTI, Multi-View Intercellular Spatial Modeling Framework, and the implementation of this framework, uh, MISTI R, that we have developed here at the Institute for Computational Biomedicine at uh, uh, Heidelberg University in Germany. All right, so what MISTI is, MISTI is a machine uh, learning tool. It actually, it is a, a multi-view uh, learning framework where that, that enables uh, users to analyze their, their spatial, their, their spatial uh, data. Right? And when I say spatial data, I mean, uh, we believe that it can be used with uh, all kinds of uh, highly multiplexed and spatially resolved data. What MIST is about is, uh, is it allows you to, to leverage spatial information beyond analysis of uh, patterns of individual markers that are available in your data and beyond analysis of your immediate neighborhood. Uh, so what MISTI does is tries to relate the expression of markers that are available uh, within your data coming from different spatial contexts. So at input, we always get an expression of uh, different markers that are measured for your spatial data at, uh, at a spatial unit. And I say spatial unit because spatial data these days comes in different resolutions. So it can be at a level, at a molecular level, or at a cellular level, or, or at a, or the, or at the uh, level of, uh, of a spot capturing multiple cells. So I always stick to, uh, to, to spatial unit. So MIST starts first by, by trying to associate the expression of the markers within the spatial unit with, with the expression of every other marker. And this basically captures the, the intrinsic view uh, of a spatial unit. So what we can do next is we can try to, uh, to look in the immediate neighborhood of each cell and, and, and ask the question, can we relate the expression of markers that are in the immediate neighborhood of each spatial unit with the expression of the, of the markers within, uh, within that unit? And we can go even further and say, let's say, uh, let's look at the at the broader tissue structure and ask the question: Can the expression of the markers in the broader tissue structure tell us something about the expression of the marker within within each spatial unit? 
Um, so this is just this is just an example of what kind of questions we can ask uh, with MISTI and what type of analysis we can do with our spatial data. But MISTI is not limited to only these three views. We can extend our uh, our analysis and we can ask different questions. So we can create a, a view that captures the pathway activities uh, within uh, within space and try to 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 ask questions about the uh, the the, the uh, the the uh, interactions of, of different pathways uh, coming from from different spatial context with the pathway activity within the spatial unit so uh, what misty does after it models the expression coming from the different views it combines this information in a meta model and tries to uh, to answer the question uh, where this information comes from uh, and where the most relevant information comes from in particular, to, to, to sum up, MISTI gives a, 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 tries to give an answer to, to, to these three general questions. So how much can the, the, the intercellular or the spatial context explain the expression of each marker within the spatial unit in contrast to, the, to what is available from, from within that unit? So with the meta model, we try to, uh, to answer the question of how much different view components that we try to, uh, to capture with, uh, with MISTI contribute to explaining this expression. And finally, we want to go even deeper and decompose the models and ask what are the specific relations, what are the specific interactions that can explain the contributions that we see uh, within this model. All right, so I'm happy to say that from uh, since Bioconductor 3.13, MISTI, uh, MISTI R, the implementation of MISTI, uh, is part of the Bioconductor family of packages. Um, so it is uh, available from Bioconductor. You can download it, you can install it. Uh, we want to make MISTI as available as possible to everyone. So this is why we also built Docker images that are based on Rocker. Um, we uh, maintain stable and development versions that are automatically built from, uh, from the source code that is openly available from, uh, from GitHub. We also include uh, package, the packages Soirat and Spatial Experiment within this, uh, this image because uh, we know that, that, that most of, of the people tend to, to use one of these formats to represent the spatial data and we are looking forward and we are working on, on extending this, uh, this group of, of data representation packages. To, to be interoperable with uh, with MISTI. Uh, right, so the central uh, the central resource for MISTI can be found at this URL that you see on the top of the slide. All right, so this is a package down uh, website for, uh, for for the package MISTI R. Uh, so feel free to take a look uh, at, at the documentation that is available uh, from this website, uh, especially the uh, the getting started part where you can learn how to how to build a simple pipeline. With, uh, with with MISTI that I'm going, going to try to, to show you that, that it's very easy to do actually now live. Uh, but, but also you can take a look at the, uh, at some articles or some vignettes that are also available with the packages and how uh, how can we use MISTI with, uh, with, packet, with data representation using uh, the SOIRAT package or data representation using the single experiment or single cell experiment, the, the spatial experiment or single cell experiment package. All right, so now I'm going to go and try to show you an example of how we can uh, easily model uh, spatial data with MISTI. So building a workflow or a pipeline uh, with MISTI, um, uh, you need to, to, uh, to be aware of, uh, of four classes of function that are available for this. So first we have uh, a family of function for view composition. Right? And here you can see uh, in, this, in this code that is the actual code from uh, uh, from MISTI, how we can how we can make a composition of these three basic views that I explained at the beginning of this presentation for a single slide, right? So then we have functions that deal with model training. So once we have the views, we want to, ex uh, to, to model the interactions between the variables that are uh, that are de that are uh, describing each view, right? And then we want to collect the results. We want to process the results. If we have uh, more than one slide, we want to, uh, to aggregate these results. And finally, we want to be able to, uh, to plot some of the results to see what we have. So building work workloads with MISTI is designed with the use of pipe operators in mind. So you can, you can use the, um, the, the pipe operator, that, the operator that is now available uh, natively from, uh, from R4.1, or you can use uh, other pipe operators like the one from uh, from Tidyverse that, that actually MISTI re-exports. If you want to see some examples of, of pipelines of analyzing spatial data with MISTI, you can, uh, you can see that from the, 
uh, following the link that is on the, on the lower left side. All right, so going to uh, going to visualizing the, the data. So once we have run our models and we have collected the results, and here I'm using a data from a spatial proteomics data set uh, from a breast cancer samples that were measured with imaging my cytometry. Uh, references are uh, in the bottom right. All right. So here we can see the, the type of, uh, of plots that we can get with, uh, with MISTI. So here on the left side, we, we see how much more information in terms of gain in variance explained absolute uh, we get when we include multiple views uh, on top of the intrinsic view. On the right side, we can see uh, a plot where we where we see how much is the contribution of uh, of the variance explained uh, given given by each of the views that are included in the model. And here, interestingly enough, and this is something that happens when we analyze data with MISTI more frequently than not, we see that taking into account the tissue structure view, we gain more information than looking only at the local neighborhood. Like further on, we can go into each one of the models of, of the of the spatial uh, that, that are specific for the for the spatial context that they capture and take a look into the interactions that uh, that explain the the performance of the model. So you see, we, we generate this type of heat plots where um, below you you see the, the the predictor marker expression, uh, and then on the left side you see the targets, and with with the blue shading we uh, we didn't. We, we show how important this interaction was uh, estimated to be by the by the model. All right, but sometimes if we have multiple multiple markers, or we have, if we are looking, for example, spatial transcriptomics, or we are looking at other type of omics data that captures multiple markers, this can this can get a bit confusing. So that's why we offer um, plotting of of contrast of, of different views, for example. Uh, we want to ask the question, okay, what are the important interactions that MIST identified uh, from the paraview, uh, from the broader tissue structures that are important, but were not found to be important in the interview. And in this way, we we highlight the interactions that that, that MIST found to uh, to be uh, spatially relevant, that, that points that point toward uh, communication coming from uh, from from cells or from spatial units from uh, from the broader tissue structure. Furthermore, if we have most more samples in the day in, in our data and they're well annotated, for example, we would like to make a, an intergroup contrast. If we are analyzing um, tumor data coming from, from tumors with different grades, we might be interested to see okay, what are the, the interactions coming from the broader tissue structure that appear in grade three tumors but are not appearing in grade one uh, in grade one tumors. So this is uh, this is also something that is available uh, out of the box uh, with MISTI. So furthermore, we are working more and more uh, on integration with, uh, with different bioconductor packages. So uh, to mention some resources that can be used for, for generation of views. So these are uh, on the right side, mostly tools that are being developed uh, within a lab. So we have Progeny, uh, that is a tool for estimating pathway activity from transcriptomics data. We have Dorota, which is a resource uh, containing uh, regulons that we use for estimating transcription factor activities, and of course we have uh, Omnipath. It is a it is a resource of uh, of a resource database of all kinds of, of biological information. So to see how we use this uh, in practice, you can uh, you can read our paper. You can read either the MISTI paper or one of the applications paper of MISTI and see how we we try to to associate pathway activities. Uh, within uh, within each spatial unit, with for example the the expression of ligands in the in the broader tissue structure. As I mentioned, uh, from from bioconductor packages, we already uh, have demonstrated how to use the, the single cell experiment and the spatial experiment package to represent the data and to work with your data uh, with MISTI. We are now working on uh, on integrating and showing how to use Cytomapper and either uh, another bioconductor package especially the site image uh, list object in order to model spatial proteomics with MIST. So with this, I'd like to, to finish the, the presentation and to thank the people that were involved in the, in the development uh, of this package from our group. Thanks. Thank you, Jovan. That was very interesting. Uh, as always, uh, for those of you who have questions for him, please uh, put them in the Q&A and uh, go in and upvote your favorite questions and we'll, we'll get to them after our last presentation.
So the final, the final uh, presentation on this track um, comes from uh, Katarina M. Keller um, from the Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg. Uh, her talk is Bioconductor Framework for Consistent Annotation of Hyperpolymorphic HLA Genes in Human Populations. Welcome to this presentation. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to present today. And I would like to talk about the recently developed package immunotation. Immunotation is a package that can be used for consistent annotation of HLA genes in humans. For those of you who are familiar with HLA MHC molecules, I would like to just say that HLA molecules are the same as MHC molecules only for humans. HLA-dependent antigen presentation is important for our immune system in order to recognize foreign antigens, but also in order to differentiate between self and foreign antigen. Um, MHC molecules um, can bind peptide antigens, so um, short peptide fragments of 8 to 18 amino acids, um, and these uh, HLA peptide complexes can be recognized by specific T-cell receptors on the T-cell surface. The binding of a T-cell receptor to an HLA peptide complex will lead to activation of the T-cell. In order to recognize a broad spectrum of pathogens, in order also to um, provide a, a good fitness level on a population scale, it is important that these HLA molecules are structurally diverse. In humans, this um, structural HLA diversity is ensured by genetic mechanisms such as polygeny and also allelic diversity. HLA molecules are encoded in the HLA genes located in the HLA complex on the human chromosome 6. This is one of the most diverse genetic loci in humans. Um, the uh, class 1 and class 2 molecules exist of HLA molecules, um, and they differ slightly in their structure um, as well as the type of cellular interactions that they can mediate. But in both cases, a peptide is bound within the peptide binding cleft of the molecule. Um, up to date, there exist around 20,000 HLA1 encoding alleles and around 7,000 HLA class 2 encoding alleles that are known and referenced in public databases. If you look at the sequence diversity on protein level, depicted here on the right in red, is um, that um, so you, you see that most of the sequence diversity is located within the peptide binding cleft of the HLA molecule. And this further highlights the fact that there is an evolutionary benefit of having a, a diverse um, set of HLA molecules in a population, which would then also um, present a, a diverse set of peptides on their surface. So um, as a bioinformatician, it can be challenging in order to work with this um, huge genetic and sequence diversity uh, and to keep a consistent nomenclature for the HLA molecules. This is um, one due to the fact that different immunoinformatics tools use different nomenclature schemes. And two, this is also due to the fact that um, different levels of experimental evidence exist in order to type HLAs. So there are sequencing, hybridization, and also serotyping approaches, and each of them leads to a different level of evidence, and um, interconversion between the different levels can be challenging. So it can be challenging, for example, to um, work on a human donor cohort and perform HLA typing on DNA level, and then use this information in order to predict the ligandome of the HLA molecules. With our package immunotation, we address this difficulty and implement a consistent and reproducible framework for HLA name and conversion in Bioconductor. Our immunotation package is based on um, an ontology called the MHD restriction ontology, which was published in 2016 by Vita et al. And this ontology provides rules of how the loci, genes, alleles, and also the protein chains, the alpha and beta protein chains, relate to each other. We use this uh, reference list of rules in order to um, implement the immunotation package. And the functions that we provide in order to, to work with this are conversion functions that allow conversion of HLA namings between different levels, and also allow, for example, to retrieve all possible protein complexes in a given genotype. This can be useful if you work with 
um, HLA ligandomes in large patient cohorts, for example. In addition to these naming conversion functions, we also implement functions um, for more um, specialized use. So I would like to highlight two of them. The first one are P groups. P groups are um, groups of HLA alleles with same protein sequences in the antigen binding site, um, but maybe different uh, nucleotide sequences. So this means that the allele names of these uh, HLA alleles would be different. However, the protein sequences in the interesting antigen binding domain would be the same, and you might want to group them. We use group definition according to HLA alleles.org. The second um, conversion tool that I would like to highlight here is the MAC conversion tool. Uh, MAC stands for multiple allele codes. Um, these uh, have been defined initially by the National Bone um, Marrow Donor Program, but they are also used in other clinical HLA typings by other, by other national marrow donor programs. We provide uh, and implement the um, encoding and decoding functions from uh, the multiple allele codes. In addition to these conversion functions and mapping functions, our immunotation tool can also be used to automatically access reference databases, such as the allele frequency net database. The allele frequency net database is a, is a database of worldwide HLA frequencies, um, and these data sets can be used, for example, as reference data sets. In immunotation, we provide functions to retrieve allele frequencies query population meta information, and also visualize the worldwide HLA frequencies using MAPS and ggplot2 packages. Um, I would like to show one example of how our immunotation package can be used to resolve annotation conflicts between data sets. On this slide, um, we see uh, two data sets. The first data set is a data set of observed frequencies. These are HLA allele frequencies that I typed using an HLA typing tool based on RNA sequencing data from a large uh, German donor cohort. So the experimental evidence level of this um, data set is RNA sequencing. And the second data set is a German reference population, which I took from the allele frequency net database. Um, and here the level of experimental evidence is, um, is based on hybridization methods. And of course, you want to compare these data sets and see whether the distribution of allele frequencies is similar. Um, since both of them are German populations, these, uh, these frequencies should be similar. So if you do this using a naive mapping approach shown here on the left, you find that um, there are uh, huge differences between the allele frequency uh, distribution, especially for HLAA shown here. Um, and this naive mapping approach does not work so well. So this is based on, on simply truncating the, the name of the allele in order to make them fit together. This does not work well. However, if you use the mapping functions implemented in immunotation, you find that the correlation of the HLA frequencies in the observed data set and in the reference data set is much better. So in these cases, our package can be very useful, especially when working with large patient cohorts. Um, with this, I would like to conclude. Um, so we developed immunotation, a bioconductor package that can be used for conversion between different HLA nomenclatures. We implement also functions for P groups and MAC encoding and decoding. And we allow automatic access to the HLA frequency database. The immunotation package can be found on GitHub here and is also available in the latest bioconductor release. If you're interested in HLA and uh, antigen specificity, we are also currently working on an implementation of a workflow for HLA prediction in large human cohorts. With this, I would like to end and thank everyone involved, Alexandra and Polina, two students who work with me on the project, and um, members of the Hooper Group at EMBL in Heidelberg. I would also like to thank everyone who helped me with questions related to the immune epitope database and the MNG ontology. Finally, I would like to make an announcement. So I'm soon will be moving to Frankfurt, a city in Germany, to start my own group in computational immunology. And I'm looking to recruit PhD students who would like to join me in this adventure. So if you're interested in immunology, computational immunology, bioinformatics, please contact me using my Twitter account, or also um, writing me an email. 
I'm looking to recruit PhD students to work on human immune system diversity in cancer and projects involve single cell studies of immunotherapy and inference of adaptive immune receptors. We will also stay in touch with the bioconductor community and develop software that can be used for human immunology. Um, thank you for joining my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions and uh, contact me if you, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina, and congratulations. That's really exciting for you. OK, uh, if, uh, if you guys have, have additional questions for Katerina, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, go through and upvote your questions. That, was, that concludes the last talk. And now we'll start uh, going through some of the questions that we've got. Um, I'll start with, uh, with our most upvoted question that we have. This is a question for Evo from Big Omics. Can, can the application produce an R script from the chosen analysis for reproducibility's sake? Um, no, it can't at the, at the moment. Um, also, our, our scripts are pretty ugly if you want to see it. But uh, again, it's open source, so you can see the source code. And I think if if you if it's reproducibility, there are other ways. And for example, the Docker is available, so you can always keep the Docker for years to come and reproduce the same um, results um, that you get. Um, so I think we have to go beyond saying like, okay, uh, we need a script. No, the, the Docker itself is um, saved, and you can just download a specific version um, and reproduce your results. Uh, I know that uh, our studio people are working on the Shiny Meta to, to, to extract the code from the Shiny. So maybe in future we will do that. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think the the of course the, the the beauty of Docker is that your your environment gets preserved. Um, yeah. yeah. But the actual steps that you took to, to do the analysis is uh, uh, is something else. Uh, I, I suspect that maybe that, that latter bit was the flavor of the question, but um, maybe it sounds like the a wait and see feature. Okay. Yeah, but, but for reproduce you can just look in out to our source code, right? Uh, if you want to know the steps, so. Sure. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you. Let's go on to the next question. For Emanuela, can uncover app lib support experiment hub based BAM files? Okay, um, uncover app take as input uh, a list containing the path of BAM file because the upload BAM file uh, could be challenges, uh, espe especially because uh, we tested the app uh, with the whole genome sequence file. So if you have the path, so, so if user have a path, uh, can store in a list and uh, upload on app. So I hope I have answer. Thank you. Did that, did that answer the question, I hope? Thumbs up. Okay. There we go. Good. Um, Emanuela, while, while we've got your attention, uh, another question about Uncover app. Oh, okay. does, it, <laughs> does it take uh, into account copy number variation and correct the, the SNVs uh, VAF accordingly? Yeah, um, okay. Uh, to date, uh, no information about copy number va uh, variation uh, could be retrieved, so it's not an option. Of course, a user can uh, use variant leaf fraction, so the VAF to retrieve uh, the number of expected read. So, for example, in uh, heterozygous variant, the leaf fraction expected in normal situation is about uh, 50%. But, uh, for example, in somatic variation, especially for uh, uh, mosaic variant, the fraction could be, could be very low. So, user, um, of course, uh, uh, could correct uh, the variant leaf fraction. Of course, yes, it's possible. Okay. Thank you. 
And I think we have time for one more question. Um, this question is for also for EO, big omics. Um, is it free for students to just do exploratory analysis? Oh, we we lost his video feed, but he's 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 popped into the Q and A, and he says yes, it is free. So, all right. Well, I think that we're I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you all for your participation. One more round of applause for all of our speakers uh, for a good job. Uh, if you have additional questions. Um, I'm sure you can you can hunt them down with direct message. You can also try to find them uh, in any of the networking rooms and lounge rooms. Um, uh, and uh, they've uh, if those of you who are, are in the market, it looks like there are some job opportunities out there at uh, some very exciting places. So um, uh, go 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 find those contact information and and reach out, send your CV. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll conclude this session, and we'll look forward to seeing you um, seeing you elsewhere at the in the session.